Why is that guy running? It's okay. Okay. It's not nice, but it's accurate. So the cleaning crew's in here, power washing, getting everything spick and span. And they're like, oh. So, so my question is, is Starfleet okay? Today we're doing a movie from the Kelvin universe, Star Trek from 2009. What'd you think about today's movie? Take it away. Star Trek 2009 Kelvin timeline video or movie number one. I give it an eight out of 10. I so want to give it a nine out of 10, but I just, I can't. Why? There's just so many plot problems, but I love it. This is one of my favorite movie experiences all, of all time, I'll say. But that, that, the more I think about it, the more there are, there are plot problems. The time travel is a mess. The whole story is kind of messy. But I honestly don't care that much. The theater experience was so awesome. Every time I rewatch it, the emotions, the, the ride, the story, it just oh, going through. It's like a, a thrill ride. Uh, there's there's great casting, great directing. It's 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 awesome. I just don't want to think too hard every time I watch it. I so bad so want to give this a nine, but I got to go with an eight because of those story problems. So for me, eight out of ten. What do you think? I give it a nine out of ten. I give it a nine out of ten because it is one of the greatest opening scenes I have ever seen. So in in the first first fifteen minutes, twenty whatever the, the opening scene, there's birth. There's death, there's battle, there's impossible odds while you maintain composure. And, the, and ultimately with, with Kirk's dad sacrificing himself for the safety and for the survival of his entire crew, this just mm -hmm. hits, it hits on so many emotional levels. It's just, it's so satisfying. I remember being in the theater and, and as soon as the, as soon as the opening credits started, I was like, this is going to be a good movie. Like I, I like said it really quietly in the theater, but like I knew it right away. There's great casting, great casting, like the, the actors fit the parts very nicely and the characters the characters are super fun it's like a very enjoyable movie that i can i could have fun with and and it's good pacing there is little bits of lulls here and there but they make sense they make sense why there should be a little bit of a lull in the middle of the movie before it, before it picks back up and the stakes are big it really felt like a big movie it felt like this could be the end of the federation that's exactly what i want from a summer blockbuster super fun and the characters, the characters have clearly defined personalities, clearly defined motivations, and their actions make sense given that those are those are those that that those are the people. The cons. The cons is that Starfleet is nearly destroyed by Nero, but is Nero some master tactician? Is he some clever genius? Is he or even if he if he is he some like super powerful war hero? Like he's just a minor. Like he's just and, and his strategies are actually very poor. He could have done a lot more for the Romulan Empire if he had just not sat around for 25 years. Super weird. And then also these two ships from the future, Spock ships and Nero ship, I, I want them to be captured by the Federation so badly because it would, it would represent a huge leap forward in technology, but instead they both get destroyed. I think that's weird, but sure, whatever. Overall, nine out of 10, super fun movie. Love it. Shall we? Let's begin. So this is the beginning of the movie, the, the amazing opening scene. We see the bridge ops aboard the USS Kelvin. Do the bridge ops, are they good? Do they make sense? Let's watch. I have a reading. They've locked weapons on us. Red alert. Torpedo locked on us at 320 degrees. Mark two. Armed up with the SF Falcon Delta V. Incoming. That guy. Wait, 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 wait. Why is that guy running? This is a bad situation. He's just running across the bridge. Got to get the steps in, man. Keep it tight. I'm guessing he's going from one station to another, but that means they're not prepped for battle. They're in real trouble. That's right. Oh, gosh. Yeah, okay. So you're saying that either his stations should be next to each other or there should be separate people doing separate stations. But if he has to run across the bridge, like this is a dire situation. Right, because if, if they if they get hit in that moment, Star Trek doesn't have, like the, inner, I guess this is the Kelvin, the inertial dampeners aren't able to hold them in place. So they kick, they get kicked. That's he right. Get injured, knocked out. He hits out, his head, killed. and now actually both stations are unmanned. That's right. Oof! High stakes. Mm -hmm. Coming fast! Fire all phasers! Damage report. Warp drive has been knocked out. Never seen anything like it. Weapons offline. Main power thirty-eight percent. They're firing another. Boat popping over shield. <laughs> oh, that scene in the theaters. It made me feel yeah. okay. First of all scientifically accurate very good you get a hole in your hull and people will get sucked out in space and there's, there's just there's nothing you can do like you grab at 
like literally mm. nothing, like not mm. even grabbing an atmosphere. And then she recoils off of the, the, what is this? Phaser, phaser ball. Yeah. Ah, brutal, brutal. Like the reality of space travel. Mm. Yeah. And also scene. the, she's screaming and there's all this noise. And then as the atmosphere leaves, it just dials down to zero. It's like, oh, there truly is nothing in space. Mm-hmm. Mm. Chills. So one of the observations I have is they're all saying stuff, but who are they talking to? I mean, sort of going into the bridge. I see. But communication, if everybody's talking at the same time, how could the noise. information get from who it's supposed to get to? from the person that's saying it to the person who it's supposed to get to it just becomes this yeah it's cacophony it's just everyone right. shouting like who, who am i supposed to be listening to right now i have mixed feelings about that because on one hand you went like tight communication is like you press mm -hmm. press f4 and it goes sends sends my message to tactical press f3 it sends it to shields or whatever right yeah but on the other hand for situational awareness maybe you just want everyone to know like, like you announce it to the room and then whoever needs that information takes it. So I like that. But what if two people start talking at the same time? Like, how are you going to say? I'm sorry. Now we're dead. <laughs> and the, the captain's like, somebody <laughs> talk. <laughs> so it looks like they have rules for determining who speaks because nobody talks over another person. Maybe it is systematic. They like cycle through the room. It's just a constant cycle. If you have nothing to say, then it's just five seconds of silence. Just or just like, green light and keep going. Mm -hmm. Like comms are good. So know, maybe. maybe, but man, it would be hard to take in all that information because you're getting information in, on the bridge from multiple stations. People yelling their information. Are they yelling it to the captain? And he's sort of taking so, it all in. Gosh, so some information is not important enough for the captain to know. Some information needs to go to the captain, so that way the captain can decide and like disseminate orders out. So, but I could also imagine that maybe they've been a crew for a long time, and so mm -hmm. they just know how to communicate very effectively. They know how to like mm -hmm. to, and and it must be a captain's skill in order to be able to hear everyone's input and then figure out what do I need to do from this information. Yeah, so maybe it's just a really good captain. Maybe that's normal for a captain. Okay. Okay. Like, can we watch it one more time and just see? Yeah what information they say from the beginning from the beginning let's do it let's do it i have a reading this guy has a reading he has a reading they block weapons on us red alert. <laughs> weapons lock yeah <laughs> weapons lock that's important red alert yeah so yeah so you gotta know what the situation is tactical situation and then captain says red alert yeah torpedo locked on us at 320 degrees mark two armed up with evasive pattern delta five incoming fast fire all phasers okay. So, so far, all weapons stuff. I guess that's right. Like, mm -hmm. You got to be aware of what's coming in towards you and then get everyone up ready for battle. And then also you need to know what to send back. to them. Right. Sounds good. And I guess, I guess, uh, Kirk, this is Kirk's dad in this case, George Kirk. He not only said weapons lock, but he gave a position, which must be relevant to the captain. Cause then the captain gives like a maneuver sequence mm -hmm. based on mm -hmm. that position. So maybe that's what happened there. Hmm. Warp drive's been knocked out. Never seen anything like it. Weapons offline. Main power thirty-eight percent. They're firing enough. Yep, got to know what the what the got to know what the health is of your vehicle. Otherwise, you're like go somewhere, yeah. but then like the engine's not working. So I think I think that was the captain is talking to the engine room through his yeah. like chair comms. So the bridge crew actually isn't hearing that communication. Hmm. So I think that's good. Well, I mean, it's it's loudspeaker. It's not like an earpiece. So maybe the helmsman, maybe the helmsman already knows the engine's not working. Gosh, would you oh, want like nothing? <laughs> yeah. Gosh, would you want that to be a readout on some panel somewhere instead of having to verbally communicate it? I think cause... so. Because then, because then you could be immediately updated of what the, the status is on the engine. Right, and then you have a console on the bridge. I don't know, but it's a, it's a, an emergent situation. So maybe he just calls down and says, what's the deal? Yeah. Get me the mm -hmm. update right now. Yeah. Stabilization has been lost. Are our shields even up? Deck 
Target 13, we have confirmed casualties. 11% and dropping, 10%. Shields at 9, we're dropping. All demanding power to forward shields. Prepare shuttles for evacuation. So that seemed more chaotic to me. I wasn't, it wasn't clear if they are talking to the whole bridge, they're talking to their people. It kind of just... As far as I can tell, it's just out to the entire room. Right. Maybe it is out of the entire room means for the captain's ears. Hmm. And they have a rotation. So station one talks, and then station two talks, then station three, then four, five, six, seven, and then start with one again. Just go around the room constantly. So nobody talks over one another. If you shout, that means for the captain. If you need to talk to your people, you do it on your microphone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I like that. I like mm -hmm. that. I wonder if the military actually does. I don't know. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. This guy, this guy's in the shuttle. Captain, you know, temporary Captain Kirk tells this guy to go and he goes. He doesn't talk back. He doesn't do anything. He just follows orders. Love it. Also gave me chills in theaters. I need you to go now. Do you hear me? We're waiting on you, sir. No, just go. Take off immediately. That's an order. Yes, sir. Difficult situation. He wants George Kirk to be there. That was what he was expecting. He does mm -hmm. one clarification question, and then he gets orders to go, and then he goes. Done. No talk back. No nothing. No waiting. Mm -hmm. He's going. Mm -hmm. I mean, good operations. Good operations. I, as this guy, he's the pilot of the of the escape shuttle, mm -hmm. and he wants the temporary captain to be there. He's, I mean, of course, he wants to save his fellow, fellow crew member, but he gets an order yep. from a superior officer, and he's like, "Go!" He's like, "Understood. Go." Go. Oof, yep. Tight, tight discipline. None, none of this, like, "No, we're going to wait for you." And then, and then, and then, George Kirk is on the bridge, like, incapacitated. <laughs> like, like, right. Take your order. Execute. In fact, you have to follow the orders because this is the pilot. He's focusing on the piloting of the shuttle. He doesn't have the overall battle picture like the people on the bridge do. So he has to follow their orders because he can't countermand it because he doesn't have the information to do it. Great work. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so after the introduction, we see what it's like on Vulcan. And I notice it's a very harsh climate. And I wonder, does that tie in with our personalities? So very very sparse very stark yeah. so we see the cliffs here or the, the rocks not cliffs we see the, the mountain and it's just bare it's not like lush and green and full of life even their transportation isn't like hustle and bustle like los angeles lots of cars going different directions they're like single monorail and yeah even out here I mean, like we see further away into the mountains and it's just barren really just dry like hard to survive in this climate And I think that's why they have these upside down buildings, maybe speculation. I don't know, mm -hmm. but these are really interesting because why, I mean, why, what are, what are the advantages or disadvantages of building these buildings from the bottom of a pride rock <laughs> formation? Yeah, pride rock. Yeah. The giant pride rock, I guess. I mean, if you have materials that are good under tension, which I guess is. So tension steel. is pulling. Yeah. Yeah. And you have the space then if you can build buildings under tension instead of under compression, might as well. I don't see any disadvantage to doing tension instead of compression. So we build here on earth in compression with concrete because concrete is very, very good against crushing. Yeah. But also then it's also very, it's relatively brittle. So you also build in rebar in the structures out of steel so that way your building can withstand crushing and stretching and so that way with the wind it can flex mm -hmm. a little bit but not mm -hmm. fall apart and so you're saying here are these vulcans i guess have very strong against stretching material mm -hmm. i thought Which it was I guess also oh, go ahead, it's going to be steel right i mean steel you i think or we I guess, learned I mean, steel our, is good under human. compression but it's even better under tension exactly right it does not stretch very well um yeah, I mean, or whatever Vulcan material, I mean, whatever Vulcan materials they have. I thought, I thought this was clever for two reasons. One is because you naturally get a sun barrier. Like if we That's look true. here on the mm. surface, it's this super barren. There's all these buildings down here are just directly getting sunlight. And, and I guess also, also, uh, is this good for cleaning? Cause you can like wash the floor up here at the top. And then just as the water goes down, eventually you just vent it out the bottom, like super easy to clean. Oh, so yeah. But looking at this harsh planet, 
I've wondered, like, is is that why Vulcans are super dry? I mean, I mean, okay, dry, dry because it's dry climate. I mean, dry because like when you're in a climate that requires group cohesion in order to maintain your food resources to, mm-hmm. to manage it, you can't be so wasteful. And so you can't just be like flippant and having fun and throwing things away. You got to be, you got to be careful. You got to be careful with your resources. And so does that, cre- does that create, does the restriction of resources caused by the harsh climate create a culture where people are very dry? I think this is a theory of like human development where cultures that grew, grew up came about developed, in, developed. Yeah. developed in harsh climates because group cohesion is essential. Like you can't even live there if you don't have it. That has effects on personalities and group dynamics that if somewhere is plentiful, they don't have those, they have different personality traits. Right. So it would make sense that Vulcans have a particular personality set and group dynamic set of behaviors because of, gosh, there's not even any vegetation. Where I mean, do you get water? Maybe out here, maybe I mean, it's just too far to see, but mm-hmm. definitely where this city is built, it's just barren. It's just it's got to be hard to live here. And and looking at the whole of oh, the overview of the planet, I'm not seeing any green. Like I think I, I think I got pictures of this. That looks pretty barren. It's pretty barren. Yeah, so you can't have people having water fights, having fun, you know, water balloons, right. squirt guns, super soakers, like, no, 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 like, be serious. Logic says we should not be messing around with the resources, tighten up. Then even, thing, even things like hunting, hunting and gathering, mm-hmm. like, where would you do that? I, I got more sand, like, <laughs> I gotta Logic be- Logic dictates eat the sand. <laughs> eat the sand, it's nutrients. Hmm. Like, I can't even do that. I can't just wander around. I have to be very thoughtful about how I acquire even the basics. Mm -hmm. And so I think that would create a culture that's very logic driven because there's just very little margin of error. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Explains a lot about France. Okay. So at the, (laughs) so at the Vulcan Academy, we see young little Spock and he's getting his feelings hurt. And so he's getting bullied by the older kids and they say these things about like, oh, we're logical, we're Vulcans, but actually are they are they they're just full of emotions let's watch it's also super cool academy for the volume of a sphere four thirds pi times the radius cube super cool super cool i would love to study in a place like this because you get you get these little bowls that you sit in with like with high resolution graphics all the way around and the way that these are shaped when you're speaking to your to the machine that's asking you questions, your sound doesn't travel to the next person. It goes up into mm-hmm. this big cavernous room. Mm-hmm. So uh, even though you have all these students here, all these pupils, it's probably pretty quiet in your little your little nook. At the same time, they're standing the whole time. They have no break. That's right. That's right. Yeah, give me a chair. <laughs> give me, yeah, mm-hmm. and already, yeah, yeah, just, just okay. Okay. What is the dimensionality? Four thirds pi times when is an action set? When it is morally praiseworthy, but not morally obligatory. Real subtle there. They say, they they ask the question, "What's the volume of the cube?" They ask it twice, so that's like super important for Vulcan culture. Yeah, you know, test that, make sure. <laughs> I didn't hear it twice, but new insults hey. for today. Affirmative. I'm neither human nor Vulcan, and therefore have no place in this universe. Look, it's human eyes. It looks sad. Perhaps an emotional response requires physical stimuli. He's a traitor, you know. Your father marrying her. That human whore. I mean, what? Come on, kids. Yeah, little Spock. <laughs> mess him up. Okay, so they go, these three sl- slightly older kids, they go yep. after young Spock and they bully him. They're like, oh, you have an emotional response? Mm-hmm. Isn't bullying already an emotional response? Like, why, why? Like, why do they want to bully him at all? Isn't that isn't that already telling that they're having some emotional feeling in them already? I think I think that's right because I think bullying is, I'm going to say, entirely motivated because of emotions. There's no reason to do it other than emotions. Right. Like, if 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 Spock is already socially, intellectually, emotionally, whatever, if they're lower than these three guys, then why did these guys feel a need to bully him? Like, whatever. Like, right. better than I'm done. In fact, it's really bad 
because an emotional reaction is in response to something. But if you do an emotional action, like these Pre-action. guys, unprompted bullying, mm-hmm. they are more emotional than Spock, who's only reacting. Right. That means whatever emotion is like sitting in them and festering, whereas Spock is like, I'm light, I'm free, I'm carefree until someone bullies me. Okay, then I respond. Then that, I respond. That, that's reasonable. Right. But if the bullying hadn't happened, he wouldn't have had an emotional response. Exactly. So these kids need to be looked into. Yeah, the way I was going to say it was <laughs> they need to get their heads out of their butts. But oh. I guess looking to get their heads out of their butts because they're like, they're like, oh, we don't have any emotion. But the, the fact that you're bullying him at all mm-hmm. means that you are full of emotion. That's right. In fact, they're using emotional language like whore in their yeah. bullying. Yeah, don't call it whore. Just a uh, uh, person of the night. A, person uh, of the night, yeah. A sex, you know, employee. Yeah, right. Neutral terms. <laughs> Yeah, neutral terms. A sex entrepreneur. Okay. But it also happens at the highest levels. Like, this is the Vulcan Science Academy, and Spock is about to accept a commission from the Vulcan Science Ad- Academy. Admission. Admission? Mm-hmm. And one of the heavy hitters casually drops bigotry for no reason. Let's watch. It is truly remarkable, Spock, that you have achieved so much despite your disadvantage. To what disadvantage are you referring? Your human mother. Why did you come before this council today? Was it to satisfy your emotional need to rebel? Live long and prosper. What's he doing? If Spock is admitted to the academy, why am I just like your mom? Like, why are we doing this? Although, I guess I could, okay. Okay, I'm gonna try to put myself in his shoes. Okay. And he's not taking shots at Spock. He's just genuinely saying, like, you have a disadvantage in your home because you don't have the pure bloodlines that we've had for Vulcans for whatever many millennia. And so, yeah, you have this a part of you in your in your brain, in your nature that's more emotional. And so, yeah, I mean, in that sense, it's actually a compliment. A compliment that's like, hey, you made it this far, even though you're a disadvantage. So in real life, if if like an admissions officer was like, hey, you're so, you're so proud of you for moving forward, except, you know, you overcame your poor ass mama. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. You're so brilliant, but you have a huge disadvantage. Your mom. Like, that's unfair, right? To even bring it up. It's okay. Okay. It's not nice, but it's accurate. But okay. 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 It's accurate. Gotcha. Uh-huh. It's accurate. I agree. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But, and you could say it in a way that is not so emotional, like saying, you know, your mama sucks. <laughs> but yeah. even the fact that you're bringing it up in this moment, isn't that That's a problem? Right. That's right. Why bring it up at all? It's already it's been like, discussed. It's like Everybody a, knows it's like it. It's a weird compliment. It's like a, it's like a backhanded compliment. It's like, yeah. good for you, but because your family's messed up. <laughs> Gus, it's not even his family is messed up. He, his family's fine. It's just his mother is from Earth. Uh, her, his, your mother's existence is messed up. Like, oof. Oh, oh my oof. gosh, guy. Okay, yeah, this guy's, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm calling it. This guy's kid did not make it into the Academy. Oh. So he's taking shots. I'm calling it. Yeah, that's my backstory. <laughs> Didn't make it in the Academy, so he's taking shots at Spock. And the only way he, the only, Spock's record is clean. He's got high scores. The only way to take shots at Spock is through his mom. Through his mom. And it hits. Talk about my mom. And actually, mission accomplished because Spock doesn't enter the academy. Mission accomplished. Exactly right. This exactly this part right. always got me right here. Where where hey, he says he says, "Is it your emotional need to rebel?" Your human mother. Why Wait, did you soon. come before this council today? Was it to satisfy your emotional need to rebel? That's totally conjecture. Like right, it's like, mm-hmm. why did you do this thing? It's because of this, like. I, I didn't say that. <laughs> you said that. In fact, would he have said something like that to a full Vulcan? Probably not. Probably not. So actually, this guy's got some emotional problems of like, I don't want Spock in the Academy because he's half human mother. Mm-hmm. So he's taking shots. He, so this guy's full of emotion, but he's always, but Vulcan's like, oh, we're no, we're mm-hmm. logic, blah, 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 logic. But it's like, mm-hmm. you got yeah. huge feelings just barely under the surface. And bigotry wins. 
That's right, because he got him out of the Academy. planet. He, he went to the Starfleet instead. And the record is untarnished. Oof. Bam, 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 bam. This is Captain Pike after the big bar fight, picking Kirk up off the floor, recognizing his greatness, even though he's a country bumpkin. This is this everybody. I want this. Yeah. The, you know, the S president of the United States, the admiral of the Navy comes down to me and recognizes my greatness, even though I've been slacking my whole life. <laughs> I've had this fantasy. <laughs> Why are you talking to me, man? Because I looked up your file while you were drooling on the floor. Your aptitude tests are off the charts, so what is it? You like being oh. the only genius level repeat offender in the Midwest? Maybe I love it. Or do you feel like you were meant for something better, something special? Enlist special. from Starfleet. Special. I'm a genius. I'm a genius. And, and like, I, yeah, yeah, I'm not like super famous. I haven't done anything with you, but people recognize it. They know it. They can they see it. it. Not, see only it. Do pe not only do people recognize it, but one, a big heavy hitter in Starfleet recognizes it. I'm just senior captain. You're going to spend his precious time with me, picking me up off the ground. That's right. Ooh, so important. All those people that were in here that are dedicating their time to Starfleet. No, I'm so brilliant. He has mm -hmm, to spend time mm -hmm. on me. Oh, nerd fantasy. I love it. I love it. I want to be Kirk. I want to be Kirk so bad. Okay, in this same conversation, Pike says to Kirk that Starfleet needs more captains to have the instinct of leap, leaping before looking. For my dissertation, I was assigned to USS Kelvin. Something I admired about your dad. You know, that instinct to leap without looking, that was his nature too. And in my opinion, some Starfleet's lost. So he... Pike says, in my opinion, it's something that Starfleet is missing, the instinct to leap before looking. But is that good? I'm going to think if you're captain of a starship, okay. most of the time you're going to want to look before leaping. Make okay. consult with your crew, you know, look at the situation, try to logic out a response or an action. I think that's okay. the right move. However, there's probably some small percentage of the time where you don't have the time to make a decision you don't have to design to like logic it through, get all the data, but you got to make a decision to go either that way or that way or up there, do something. And if you freeze in that moment, then you're in trouble. And so I guess Pike is saying that Starfleet is becoming too deliberate and they're not going and getting uh, things. So there are situations, say for example, combat, where you're like, mm -hmm. if you're like, slow it down, slow it down, slow it down. Mm -hmm you may miss your opportunity to strike. And, and, and now you've lost the battle completely because you weren't fast, mm -hmm. you weren't decisive, you weren't, you weren't yeah. decisive. Right. And, so, and so Pike is saying there's not enough in that Starfleet. I see what you're saying. And so since you mm -hmm. can't train every Starfleet captain to be situationally aware, dialed in, calibrated, mm -hmm. like this is the time to strike, this is the time to pull back, you just get captains that have a, le a tendency for leap before looking. And then mm -hmm. you get other captains that deal with other scenarios that are more like, mm, let's slow it down and collaborate and get everyone's information. I see that. I guess they could also be at an institutional level. Like in the in the original series, they go on the five-year exploration mission. mission. Mm -hmm. The institution of Starfleet could have been like, should we go on an exploration mission? Should we send out probes first? We don't want to we don't want it could be unsafe we could encounter things like mm, mm. maybe we should dial it back we'll do it we'll do a three-month mission and see how it goes or you just say hey we're explorers five years let's go and we'll, we'll handle it as we go and so it's mm. a bit of a leap before looking you don't be too deliberate so like even at an institutional level there might be some problems i see and yeah i mean again yeah, you said it. You said we're explorers. Exactly like in maritime time. Is that what it's called? An age sure. of exploration when we're going around sure. in boats. Some people, you're like, follow the coastline, map up the coastline, and we want to know where we live. Other mm -hmm. people, you're like, go. Go figure out what's out there mm -hmm. come back. So you need some balance of personalities that are cautious and some balance of personalities that are like, I'm just going to go. Just going to go. Figure it out as <laughs> when we get out there. I wonder uh, which explorers just never made it back. <laughs> I'll be a lot. Hey, but we're here now, right? Which means that some people that leap for looking did it right. Yeah, it's in our DNA. The look leap, leaping. Uh, the, the oh, leaping leap before looking. lookers, le the leapers before lookers. They were able to pass on their DNA to us. Therefore, we're the cool people. That's right. That's why we conquered the moon. <laughs> did we conquer it? Yeah, we did. American flag did. right there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so Nero. Okay, so he appears. I don't know, in the past and kills Kirk's father. 
mm-hmm. and then waits 25 years for Spock to show up. What are they doing in 25 years? Let's watch. We've arrived at the coordinates you calculated. We wait for the one who allowed our home to be destroyed, as we've been doing for 25 years. Twenty-five years is a long time. First off, excellent calculations. They like knew down right. to the second that he was going to show right. up at that particular point, based mm-hmm. on data they had. I mean, amazing. I mean, in no way were they waiting there the whole time. They have to go around to get fuel, to get food. So that means they're going around. But they right. had the right calculation to be there when Spock came out of the wormhole. Maybe none yeah. of them were. Maybe none of them were able to make the calculation when they first went through the wormhole. But they had 25 years. They got degrees. To work on it. <laughs> and they, were... <laughs> they did like an online college. <laughs> like, no, right. no, no face screen. <laughs> they like, like have the, no video camera when they're doing online classes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, even if it was video online, are people going to be like, oh, he must be from the future? Or are they just, oh, it's just, you know, that's just Mike who's also oh, in the class. He's just got different fashion. He's from a different place. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and they also have to have settled somewhere, right? They're not just going to hang out on that dark dingy ship the whole time i think they I, okay i think they stayed on the ship because if they had settled which which makes a lot of sense like i'm gonna i don't want to stay on the mm-hmm. ship for 25 years like i don't know, get build a home start a life but that's the problem if they build a home start a life he's not gonna nero's not gonna be able to keep his crew on the ship because that's because nero hates hates spock mm-hmm. but does everyone yeah. else like are they going to be able to hold on to that rage for 20 years or 25 years which which actually means to me, it means to me that Nero is actually a very good captain. He kept he kept his team together, cohesive and functioning and cooperating. Twenty five years. Twenty five years. That's good. And no, they, they had to, that means okay. They okay. Twenty five years. They had to have have some kind of shore leave, especially if they know that Spock is not going to show up for twenty five years. Like they know that. Which means That's if right. he does allow shore leave and he allows people's homes and wives and <gasps> families he's able to keep them together and go pick them up from their mm-hmm, various mm-hmm, locations mm-hmm. bring them back onto the crew and get dedicated to go take out spock and go right. kill which means, vulcan at the which same means time nero has his finger on the pulse the emotional pulse of all of his mm-hmm. team because he wants to keep him around you know what would have been the yeah. most the most savage the most the absolutely most savage revenge on spock is if if nero let his his crew have shore leave with spock's mom Paintball or whatever. Oh. What are you thinking? Jesus. This is Kirk in... So Kirk cheated on the Kobayashi Maru. Mm -hmm. And because he cheated, there's an academic review session about his cheating, which I teach. If there's a cheating problem, it'll be like a small committee of maybe two or three professors or maybe somebody from HR looking over what's going on. But not at Starfleet Academy. When there's a cheater... We have full dress attendance, you know, a thousand people in the stands for the <laughs> the cheating review board. Let's watch. This session has been called to resolve a troubling matter. James T. Kirk, step forward. Cadet Kirk, evidence has been submitted to this council suggesting that you violated the ethical code of conduct pursuant to regulation 17.43 of the Starfleet Code. Wait, wait, wait. Is there wait, wait, anything wait. you care to Look at the crowd. So the crowd is like, we're dressed up. It's going to be, you know, a raw affair, some big briefing. We're going to get some intel. What is going on? This is awesome. Oh, Kirk cheated? That's why I'm here? Oh, oh, I thought of it the other way. I was like, if I'm a cadet here, like, why am I in my dress uniform? Like, I want to be in the dining hall right now. What is happening here? And then and then someone from the audience gets called up for cheating. Like, oh, that drama. Like, ooh, what's the tea? What's going to happen right now? I'm going to watch it live. Yeah, and this massive shame session for some reason. Massive shame session. Yeah, that's right. Why don't they just handle it quietly amongst the professors? Right, and and in fact, if the cheating, if there's cheating allegations, you don't want to make it public until it's until it's Confirmed. clear that the cheating has actually happened. If you shame session somebody, and then it turns out, oh, actually, we were mistaken. He hasn't cheated. Everybody's like, Kirk's a fucking cheater. Like, right. That's right. That's right. They're ganging up on him and bullying him. Because what if what if he did not cheat? And now and then it comes to light that he didn't cheat. And now the panel has to eat their words. Like that's super bad. That's super bad. Plus, I'm a cadet. I've got homework. I've got 
things to take care of. I'm not going to get this I've time been, back. I got to put my my dress uniform on. I got to show up to this on time. I want to be in fencing class right now. Fencing class is dope. Oh well, yeah, I could be. I could be in the rec room. I could be doing homework. I could be studying. I could be eating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Instead, I'm here. There's there's no way for every regulation infraction they have a large. I don't know what you would call this session. Hearing like this. session, yeah, this like auditorium styled seating. Everyone gets to watch him. <laughs> Although if they had pizza, yeah, I'll, well, that's I'll right. That. That's that's oh, how it's yeah. done. Man, okay. the back room, like the, mm. the I guess the atrium where you come in, it's like stacks of pizza. Everybody's like, yes. <laughs> They're like, but like, don't eat it yet. You have to wait until you go out of the auditorium. I was like, oh my gosh, I can no, smell it. The whole time. I can smell it. Mm. Or, or you're in the He's auditorium. Guilty. Get him out. <laughs> you're in the auditorium. You hear the doors open and like a, a cart come in. <gasps> you're like, it's coming. When, when is break time? Oh my gosh, when is the snacks? <laughs> oh my god, Kirk's guilty. Let's go. So I'll go to like scientific conferences, and it's pretty clear, like. When, when the scheduled break time, people are mentally checked out. It's whoever that last speaker is before yeah. that before the break time is like, oh, you kind of say seventy five percent of what you're gonna yeah. say. Especially if there's like a coffee smell that like wafts smell, in. Yeah. It's like yep. this. Worst is over right now. Oh my gosh! <laughs> like, good results. Okay, let's go. Yeah, yeah let's go. <laughs> coffee. One seven point four three of the Starfleet Code. Is there anything you care to say before we begin, sir? Yes, I believe I have the right. Also, he has no chance to prepare his defense. It's like, hey, I accuse you. Come up, defend it right now. That's right. Does he know the procedures for this? I mean, Probably. the procedures are defend yourself right now. Right now. You're guilty if you don't know what you can't defend yourself. Face my accuser directly. Step forward, please. This is Commander Spock. He is one of our most distinguished graduates. <laughs> He's programmed the Kobayashi Maru exam for the last four years. Clearly Cadet biased. Kirk, you somehow yeah. managed to install and activate a subroutine in the programming code, thereby changing the conditions of the test. Your point being? In academic vernacular, you cheated. Is it cheating? Wait, wait, wait. So Kirk changes the test. The teacher doesn't catch it, gives mm-hmm. him the test. But I just, the teacher gave me a test and I took it. Is that cheating? Well, that's the teacher's fault. Teacher, you gotta check your you gotta check your test. Like if I'm doing calculus and the prof- the professor's like, here's an algebra exam, and I sit down, I turn my paper over, I'm like, oh, there's algebra today. All right, crank, 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 crank. Is that my fault? Okay, so that wouldn't be cheating because the teacher gave you the wrong test. Isn't but, that what Spock did? Gave Kirk the wrong test. I don't know how this would happen in real life, but like if I wrote a test on my computer. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. and then I close the program, and then a mm-hmm. student hacks into my computer, changes the test, and somehow I hand out the papers as of during the test exam yeah. without noticing that oh, this has been altered. Yeah. Then I think the person he didn't cheat, but he did. He definitely did something wrong. He hacked into my system to change if the you test. Can prove it. That's right. How how would you know who hacked in? And it's my fault for not noticing the test had changed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Still, there's still an infraction there. I just maybe it's not the, cheating. Yeah, there's something. There's something <laughs> weird there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, in principle, like I'm just a student. I took that test, whatever you gave in front of me. But also, the test was clearly broken. <laughs> like, it was not the standard test. Something clearly wrong with this. That's right. I guess if Kirk hacked it and then uh, Spock gave it to five different people that day, so four of them did not cheat. But Kirk did because he was the one responsible for changing the test. So what you're saying is <laughs> Kirk needed his friend to change to cheat to change the programming, and then Kirk just shows up and is all super innocent, actually legitimately guilty free because he didn't do anything wrong. Okay, okay. Like, how how could you make this work? So Kirk needs to communicate to the guy to do the hacking mm-hmm. without telling the guy to do the hacking or without having the intent to do it. Because mm-hmm. the intent would make just, him guilty. Just, oh boy, I wish tomorrow's exam would be super easier tomorrow. That's enough. That's enough. Let's send send the message out there. Let it spread. Get it's a hacker still, friend that gets and does it. It's still dishonest. It's still like hey, he I knows. Mean, I want no one easy exam. Sure. I think I think this the second step is you gaslight yourself into and then you convince yourself you did nothing wrong. That's right. That's the best option. <laughs> <laughs> I think there has to be some sort of gaslighting in there to make the dishonesty to make yourself believe the dishonesty. Yeah, I like it. That makes sense. <laughs> Okay, this 
the hearing is interrupted. They, they, don't, they don't come to a conclusion. And so there's a message passed to Admiral Richard Barnett and, and he immediately sends all the cadets to, to Vulcan. And so my question is, is Starfleet okay? This is a really bad sign for the health of Starfleet. We've received a distress call from Vulcan. With our primary fleet engaged in the Laurentian system, I hereby order all cadets to report to Hangar 1 immediately. Dismissed. So the main fleet is in the Laurentian system. Far away, mm -hmm. sure. And so then here at the academy where all the students are, the admiralty is like, okay, you're all active duty now. You're all up. You're, we're not going to finish your training. You're not going to graduate. We're just active duty right now. This is like, this is like if the U.S. military was having some type of action somewhere else and then they're like we have a second problem west point you're all up you're you're active right now like we don't have enough reserves we don't have enough active military to we don't have enough other fleets to move around they they, they pulled from the people that are not yet done training so so my question is is starfleet okay like, I, I are think they, we're gonna... are they really thin there's not enough bodies to put around i think that means they're really thin they're out of ships and they're out of people and they're pulling people from training to active duty before they're ready. And I think this does happen in real war where people, when armies get depleted, they start pushing people to the front before they're ready because there just simply isn't enough bodies and mm, supplies. I've, I've also that, heard that in terms of like physical fitness will, the requirements will tank. Mm -hmm. It's like, we, we just need people in service right now. Right, also age requirements start creeping up like they broaden yeah right yeah so because starfleet doesn't have a fleet on reserve ready to jump to take action if something comes up while the primary fleet's engaged means the reserve fleet exists it just isn't manned it, it's like partially manned i mean they don't they, right. they have they probably have the higher ranking officers you get cadets. They're, the cadets are new. They're inexperienced. Mm -hmm. You get them junior people. You get them like like move this thing or like push these buttons, like simple stuff. Mm -hmm. But it still means that you don't have enough people in your fleets, and you only have two. You you don't you can't take actions in multiple places. You have two fleets. One's Laurentian. One is the one that's going to Vulcan. That's right. And you're putting the cadets. You're filling the ship. The rem the remainder of the th slots need to be filled in the ship with cadets who are totally green, who haven't mm -hmm. been trained. Mm -hmm. You're so thin on experienced people that you pull from the academy early, which now so, messes up the next class because they've got to graduate. And so, so I guess Starfleet's this this movie okay. is timed at a point of of Starfleet's growth of Starfleet's evolution that they're very thin, they're very they're very small at this stage, and so uh, yeah, there's mm. a really critical point in Starfleet's development that they can only really man one and a half fleets. Mm, that's good. Mm. Is Starfleet okay? Risky. Right, right. Risky, yeah. I mean, at some point, Starfleet had one ship, right? You got your, your first ship. And then at, and then you have two ships and three ships. You got to grow, grow, grow. And we just, we, this film is, this movie is time at a point in time of Starfleet. They're just, they're weak. They're weak right now. They're weak. They have to be weak, yeah. Scary. Mm. That'd be super scary. So this is after, okay, so after all the cadets, are they going to go up to the ship? And so they go to this hangar to get onto the shuttles to go up to the ships. Uh, let's take a look at the hangar operations, see what's going on. So cool, cool mm -hmm. ships here mm -hmm. and they're different shapes, which means we have different mm -hmm. generations of ships in operation. I think mm -hmm. that's okay, right? We don't, we don't phase out fighter jets like completely. There's like overlap yep. in time. Is it okay for... <laughs> Uh, it's why is it wet it's wet in here it's not just a little wet it's not like one ship is leaking it's wet everywhere maybe the power washing crew just came through <laughs> that's right <laughs> i mean it's 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 a unscheduled deployment so the cleaning crew's in here power washing getting everything spick and span and they're like oh here come the cadets oh 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 get get out of the way yep get, get out of the way Actually, is maybe the, the power washing crew may not even know what's going on. They may be like, what is happening with all these cadets? I mean, how, why would they get briefed? They're in charge yeah, right. of, yeah. Uh, I guess, is it okay that the shuttles are flying over top of the cadets? I think that's okay. So if it was regular, like 
modern day jet turbines, I think that would just just be deafening. And, and then right. also there's like turbulent air everywhere. But I for for Star Trek ships, they fly kind of magically. So okay. Yeah, and I guess also if there was an incident, the shuttle is going to crash down onto the cadets. That's a good point. Um, so they're super confident that the shuttles are never going to have an incident. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this is like a, gosh, I want—I don't want to say impromptu, but unforeseen, unscheduled deployment. Mm -hmm. So these these shuttle pilots got to be dialed in with their communications. They don't want two coming up at the same time. Doink. No good. Doink, and then boom, killed 100 cadets. Like we don't want that. Ooh, no good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, I would rather see the this middle section be clear. Line up the cadets yeah. closer to the ships, and that way, if there's a failure for whatever reason, it crashes on the concrete. No well, maybe I I would want the cadets on the other side of the ships, coming in. Oh yeah, 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 actually. And then the yeah. shuttles come down the middle. So if there's an incident, they fall. Yeah, that's much mm. better. Yeah, I like that. Or heck. Just over here, fly out the wall there. <laughs> These things can yeah, fly, yeah. right? That's right. Go up the top. Let's get a little bit more. <laughs> this this pilot. Okay, so who's telling this pilot where to go? It's this guy. What goes right in between uh, them? Forklift. Forklift. He can't see anymore. Yep. Gosh, I guess the forklifts have to load supplies onto the shuttle for the deployment. Okay, but what is this guy loading? There's literally nothing in here. He's just, he's just. Well, maybe he just okay, loaded. Okay. He's okay. coming back to load. Okay, actually, to... I like this, right? Because if it's low, then you could sweep the legs of all the cadets. So you put the forks mm. high, and you can from the from the driver's seat, you can see where the forks are. So you know what you're not going to hit. Right. And then you also clear everyone's head. It is also a risk because you got all these people crisscrossy. Yeah. And it's the deck isn't clear, and there could be an incident. They are these but, cool wheels, though. You know these wheels that are like six-sided wheels? And they, they don't roll forward. I mean, they do. But they also have these twisty turbine things. So you can, you get the forklift can go. It doesn't have to, like, go forward and turn. It can do mm -hmm. all sorts of different directions. That's pretty I cool. I see. Is that a real thing or is that just on, Oh, that's just a real here? thing. Oh, it is? It's like, it's like uh, forklift wheels, multiple direction. I don't know how to search that. But here it is. Oh, it's a real thing. So they can roll forward if you want to go forward. They can roll backwards and the normal things. But then you can also turn these wheels. And if you turn them, these these like rubber oh. cones things, you can get that thing to translate just sideways. Super cool. Oh, so it's like a wheel within a wheel. There's like one, two, yeah. three, oh, yeah. four, five, yeah. six wheels attached to the end of the wheel. So you get cool. I thought that was like some sci-fi well, thing. I didn't know that was a real thing. Cool. I want to see the sideways motion. There it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, so cool. Oh, cool. Neat, right? We go, Starfleet. Yeah, cool. I thought that was a Starfleet, like a like the start made for Star Trek cool tech thing. But I didn't know it was real. That is awesome. So Kirk gets in the shuttle with McCoy, and they go up here to what I think is Starbase One. So Starbase One in the regular timeline is oh, out by Jupiter. Mm -hmm. But they instead here, they in the Kelvin timeline, they leave the surface of the Earth and they're right away here in this Starbase. Yeah. Jim, you gotta look at this. Jim. Ah, oh, super cool. Cool, cool. Mm. Flagship. Wow. I want to so I cool. Like... Kind of weird. Oh, a little, little close to the door there. Yeah, right. Interesting hangar bay. Although, mm -hmm. and, and a bunch of um, shuttles. Like in the future, Star Treks, they only have like one or two shuttles. Interesting. I wonder why. Right. I guess the transporter just gets used more and more, so the shuttle requirements get less and less. I see. I buy that. I buy that completely. So what do I want to say? Yeah, here, here's Starbase. So this is Starbase 1. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so just interesting shape. 
So like why spherical with this ring and then spokes with discs? Why that shape? Yes. So the sphere means they're thinking in 3D when they're designing it. But yeah, yeah. then they sort of have a 2D docking Wait, situation. Wh why, why, why would you want a sphere? Like what what is the advantageous thing about having a sphere in, instead of like a cube or a cone or whatever? So for the given amount of r volume that maximizes your, sorry, it maximizes surface area to volume. I see. Or minimizes, ah, minimizes. So you're, you're saying you get the largest volume with the least amount of materials. Right. I see. And since you're in space, go with the sphere. Although I think square would be best. Yeah, I think so. Cube, just cube, right? Cube, cube, because it's just easier to build in cubes. With spheres, right. you've got these like curves, a, curvy end pieces right. that are like, if you're in this section, it's got to be this kind of curve. If it's in this mm -hmm. section, you got to be I see. this kind of curve. And so if, if there was a cube, you could do like 25 meter by 25 meter, just squares and just copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste all the way around the cube. Right. So it'd be but much easier thing, to do modularity. Exactly. Uh, with this thing, you have these like wide flat panels, and then over here you have like narrow slivers. Yeah. That means you can't mass produce it. You, I mean, you can mass produce it in this ring, but then the mm -hmm. next ring is different, and the next ring is different. Yeah, so cube, it's weird. Cube, cube, cube. It, it's weird. It's weird. Okay, so they have the sphere, and they sort of layer within the sphere. It looks okay. like. I think what they yeah. should have done is concentric spheres, because then that okay. takes it. So inside the sphere is first sphere and that's the floor oh and then second sphere that's the floor so you've got so like shells shells yeah like like the russian dolls like like shell inside a shell inside a shell mm -hmm. okay. that's still more annoying than it's cube. a, a cube cubes, cubes because with floors. cubes are easily modular whereas these concentric spheres each sphere is a different size how annoying is that and then if you do sphere with with levels the levels are different sizes with different end pieces. That's annoying. And if you don't have nice rectangular rooms and people's furnitures, there's always gonna be like a little dead corner. Like I can't put anything there. <laughs> like it's, it's a little curved uh, corner in my room. What do I do with this? But I like these these spokes here or this outer yeah. ring and then spokes to these discs yeah. because I, I guess you can put ships out here. To me, it would make more sense for the the end pieces of the spokes to be spheres, because then you could dock ships at all at all angles. I see. But yeah, for so, as it stands so right now, this, you can't come up. Yeah. Was if, if, if this disc was instead a sphere? Yeah. You could put a, we could have put a ship there and there and there and, and there. there. Yeah. As opposed to these discs, as they are, you can get three on that frisbee, and that's it. That's it. Yeah. Hmm. I don't understand the design. Hmm. <laughs> Donut. How about a donut? A donut shape for your space station? I guess I, I, I'm okay with donut. I'm okay with 2D flat. The weird thing is sphere and then quick transition to 2D flat donut. Mm. So it, it's essentially a 2D station with a 3D centerpiece. I see right. what you're saying. Why not all 3D or all 2D? Right. Weird mix. In fact, if you're going to make it a have these docking stations, wouldn't it make sense to have just a ball and then the, the docking stations are all on the outside? Yes. I mean, I gosh, okay. Okay. Every shape seems to make sense in some way, but there's pros and cons. Right. So, so I let's, let's get, let's look at the, so okay, first of all, I was, I was confused because mm -hmm. I, I was thought Starbase one is out by Jupiter, mm -hmm. but I guess in the Kelvin timeline, Starbase one is here right above earth. So I looked this up. I, so I wasn't even sure. So I looked it up and, and Terraformer here says that, yeah. oh, Terraform, oh, that's cool. Oh, oh. A little bit, little bit of clicking. Okay, here we go. Starbase One is seen in Discovery and Strange New Worlds. Strange New World added the biodomes. It doesn't have share the designs with the Kelvin movies. Oh, wait, wait, that's a bad reading. It also doesn't share the design with the Kelvin movies. Space Dock One is from the original series and you can see it being built in Discovery. Oh, that's really nice. That's, really that's nice cool. Tie in the Soul Station is the successor to Space Dock and the one that can be seen in Picard. So let's let's look at these. So here's Starbase One from the what is it? We said Starbase One was in Discovery and Strange New Worlds. Okay. So they have these discs 
Yeah. But also looks like some type of glass or some type of transparent dome thing. So this is like an mm-hmm. open atmosphere. I bet that's really nice for when a ship docks. Then you like it feels like you're in a, you're not in a little tube, little box. Right. Um, I like this vertical structure. I like the vertical structure because you could put a turbo lift, zoop, all the way to the top, uh, all the way to the bottom. Yeah. They know anything about a sphere is there's no clear access. That's like a turbo lift should go there. It's like the turbo lifts go just diagonal mm-hmm. through the whole thing. Like, so this seems to be a similar design to the one in Star Trek 2009, but has an improvement in that it made it a that. cylindrically symmetric situation for turbo lift mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. access. I like so that. fast fast transport as opposed to like walking around the thing, and then this is space dock one. So this is, I think this is above Earth, mm-hmm. but it's not a star base. It's space dock. And oh, it, the cool dock docking thing is it's uh, the rings and the sit, the ships sit inside the rings. That's cool. That's pretty cool. Why is that? Okay. Why would that be a good thing? I guess if you're doing maintenance or whatever, you can uh, come in at all ex- angles and you can store stuff in the ring. If you didn't have the ring, like you're, you're just exposed to space and you like drift away forever. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's also got a cylindrical, cylindrically symmetric design, which I think I like. So you get that turbo lift in the middle and mm-hmm. then you can walk on a approximately flat. I guess they do have turbo lifts that go side to side. So maybe there's spoky turbo lifts that okay. come out from the center on on. Mm-hmm. on the top I buy there. it I buy it okay and then this is soul station so this is oh, sorry so state space what oh I see they're not necessarily different it's different universes and different timelines oh, I'm confused then. or or maybe hear it space dock one is mm-hmm. from the late 23rd century to the 25th century yeah and then soul station uh, is 25th century so I think okay. this, uh, it resembles the predecessor in design, but features several additional structures. So this is in TNG and last generation. So this is the mm-hmm. replacement for space stock one. Oh, I see it. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm bouncing around. I see it. It's like that's roughly cylinder design, but also there's different radii and you get a, these discs mm-hmm. out on the side. So it seems like they converge to cylindrically symmetric is more convenient, making a ball within Docking rings are on the outside. So it's, it's kind of annoying. Interesting. I like it. I like it too. And I like the evolution of the design. It kind of makes some sense. Hmm. 